talk today is based on an article published in Physics Essays, volume 24, number two, page 260, in 2011. I have a few reprints here you can get if you want. You can also download my talk from Physics Essays uh, website. The Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe had accumulated data from more than 30 years of very accurate pre-telescopic observations of positions and motions of the sixth planet known at that time. After Brahe's death, his assistant Johannes Kepler came into possession of Brahe's record. Kepler's first and second law were published in 1609, and Kepler's third law was published in 1619. Kepler's first law, that the orbit of a planet is elliptical, and the sun, the source of the motion, is in one of the foci of this ellipse, did away with the complicated system of epicycles deference and equance that was in use by the astronomers prior to Kepler's time. And Kepler's third law that the ratio of the cube of the distance to the square of the period was a constant for all the planets was also a great contribution to astronomy. What is now referred to as Kepler's second law that equal areas are swept in equal intervals of time is given the same status as Kepler's first and third law and is published, uh, is printed in all textbooks in physics and in astronomy as a general law. It may be remarked that Kepler himself has not made such a claim. Kepler has described his second law in the neighborhood of the upsides. As a planet orbits the sun, the radius vector sweeps an area equal to delta A in, an, in a time delta T. And this is the calculation of the second law the instantaneous area swept is equal to product of velocity times the distance. In extensive tables published in the Chemical Rubber Company Handbook of Chemistry and Physics from 1970 to 1985, Joseph Armento gave the velocities and the distances of all the planets and several asteroids at perihelion, at aphelion, and at the semi-major axis of revolution. If you cannot find any editions of these years in your library, you can send me an email. I will send you these tables in an attachment. I have used Armento's figure to calculate Kepler's second law for all the pl planets, for the eight planets and the now demoted Pluto in table one, and for nine asteroids in table two. In every case, the area swept at aphelion is equal to the area swept at perihelion, and a greater area is swept at the section of uh, minor axis. So the area swept at aphelion is equal to the area swept at perihelion, but is not equal 
to the areas swept at some major axis. And the increments are a function of the eccentricity, a plot of the ratio of the average of the areas swept at aphelion and perihelion to the areas swept at semi-major versus eccentricity is shown in A. And the same ratio plotted against square of the eccentricity is shown in B. The equation of the straight line is equal to ratio is equal to 1 minus 0 0.617 times square of eccentricity. And the correlation coefficient is 0 0.9975. The ratio is equal to the square root of 1 minus square of eccentricity, which is equal to the sine of theta. At aphelion and at perihelion, the angle between the V and R is a right angle, and the sine of 90 degrees is equal to 1. At semi-major, the angle is equal to theta and is equal to the square root of 1 minus e, uh, eccentricity squared. We have the eccentricity of all the planets and of the asteroids, and we can calculate the sine of theta. And when we multiply the sine of theta for each planet and each asteroid by the area swept at some major axis, we get the same value as the area swept at aphelion and at perihelion. Angular momentum is a vector perpendicular to the plane of the orbit and is equal to mass e times uh, velocity times the distance. Kepler's second law has always been described in the two-dimensional plane of the orbit. And the product of vector and the distance here, the area is a scalar. Angular momentum is a vector perpendicular to the plane of the orbit. And is equal to velocity times the distance times sine of theta. And as shown in the two tables, it is conserved, indicating that there is no torque in the direction perpendicular to the plane of the orbits. And this is consistent with the fact that all planets orbit the sun in planes which form only small angles to the sun's equatorial plane. The heliographic latitude of the planets are given on page 61 of my book. So, in conclusion, Kepler's second law is not a general law. Equal areas are swept in equal intervals of time only at perihelion and at aphelion. And that is all that Kepler himself has claimed. If Kepler's second law were a general law, it would be inconsistent with his first and third laws. Thank you. Okay.
wants to know what happens to the conservation of angular momentum principle. Angular momentum is conserved. Angular momentum is a vector perpendicular to the plane of the orbit and is equal to v times r times sine of theta. And when I have calculated all of the sine of theta for each planet and each asteroid, then this is equal to the area that is swept. It, uh, it's equal to, uh, to the VR at uh, aphelion and at perihelion. So the angular momentum is conserved. If, it, if you get a different value, then it will show that angular momentum is not conserved. But in this case, in the cases of the planet and the asteroid, the angular momentum is conserved. My impression is that your whole discussion boils down to how you define area swept in the time. And can, you, can you repeat that? His impression is that your discussion all boils down to how you define area swept in time. And, and And uh, this is in all the textbooks in, in, uh, in physics and in astronomy, so that's the, the calculation of the second law. So, so I would say that formula is wrong. The area swept, yeah. the area swept the time includes the sine theta, and Kepler's law is correct. And your calculation the, is correct. In a short time, delta t, the radius vector r sweeps to an uh, arc, arc uh, delta s, the area the, uh, of the change of area You're delta s of the long wedge in the figure approximately one half of the of its base, and when uh, at the limit of delta t equal to zero, then the instantaneous uh, change of area in a time is equal to the product of velocity times r. And you have this in all the textbooks in physics. Thank you.